Thanks for being back today for our, que our Tough Questions series. Today we're going to talk about the question of sex, and it's one of the most difficult questions that we have to grapple with in our world today. If you've been watching the news, you know that Hollywood has a real public relations problem right now when it comes to sex. It's been uncovered in multiple people in the film industry that they have uh, you know, been exposed, some of them as pedophiles and predators. They've been accused anyway. And uh, many people have been accused of abusing their position and their power in the film industry to sexually exploit others. And what a terrible uh, crisis that is, not only in that industry, but in many. But Hollywood certainly has a PR problem when it comes to sex. I want to tell you as well, I believe the church has a tremendous public relations problem when it comes to sex. You say, well, is that right, Pastor? It's absolutely right. In 2007, George Barna, a very popular Christian pollster and researcher, did a study among non-Christians, and he asked them specifically, why have you chosen to reject the Christian faith? The number one answer given by 91% of them is they said, Christianity has outdated views on sexuality that I don't agree with. And many people say in our day, uh, the Christian view of sexuality has no place in modern society. That's said all over. Now, you and I might say, some of you here anyway, you may agree with that statement. Many of you here would not agree with that statement. Some people, when I throw out something like that, they say, well, they say the Christian view of sexuality has no place in the modern society. They're wrong, and I don't care what they think. And that's what people say. Don't clap. Uh, they may be wrong, but we better care about what they think. They may be wrong. I believe they are wrong. Believe me, I, I think the Christian biblical view of sexuality is needed today more than ever. But we better care about what our tar target audience thinks. Let that sink in. We better care about what the world we're trying to lead to Jesus Christ thinks on this issue. I think a big part of the PR problem between the church and the world regarding sex is our fault. I believe we've made some mistakes. We've treated sex. I was raised in church, and I always heard that sex was dirty. It was bad. It's something to be avoided at all costs. The, the teaching that I got in my life from the church about sex as I was growing up in a church kind of like this one, I kept uh, getting all I got was don't do it. Don't think about it. Don't act on it. Don't do it. That's what I got. How many of you know to a teenage boy, don't do it does not get the job done? In fact, many of us, and it's true of our human nature, when you tell somebody not to do it and you treat it as something forbidden, you add a mystique to it that actually draws people to it. Do a test on your children if you want to try this out. If you've got small children, tell them, say, I'm going to leave you in this room for the next hour, and you can play with anything in this room, but there's one thing in this drawer right here that I don't want you to touch. Stay away from it. As soon as you close the door, they're going to go for it. And we've created that kind of mystique with sex as saying it's so bad, it's so forbidden, and it's so off limits that our sinful human nature said, wow, they're talking so bad about it, it must be fun. One preacher told this story of when he was a young man, he went to a youth camp and he heard a preacher speaking to try to convince them not to have sex. And he said this, the preacher said, sex is nasty, dirty, sex is disgusting, so save it for the one you love. <laughs> How do you like that? Truth is, many early church leaders frowned on sex. One of the early church fathers had himself castrated to avoid the temptation of sex. And many church leaders saw sex as just a necessary evil that married couples participate in only to have children. But you shouldn't enjoy it. In fact, some of the early Pentecostals, there was actually teaching in the early Pentecostal church that when a married couple had sex with each other, get this, the Holy Spirit actually lifted off of them during that act and he came back after it was done. 
It was a concession God made just so we could have children. Let me tell you what. Sex is not bad. Sex is good. In fact, it was God's idea in the first place. Sex is a beautiful gift of God given to us. 1 Corinthians 7, 2-5, we're going to look at it today. The apostle wrote, because there's so much sexual immorality, people were asking Paul, is it a good thing to remain single? Paul was single and he dedicated his whole life to the work of Christ. And they were asking him, is that good for everybody? Should we do it? And he said in verse 1, it's a good thing if you have that gift. If you have the gift of celibacy, it's called, to be single and work for the Lord, it frees up a lot of time to work for Jesus. But he said, because there's so much immorality, there's so much temptation each man should have his own wife and each woman should have her own husband he said because there is so much temptation you should get married it's better to marry than to burn with lust so each uh, man have a wife each wife has a husband then he says this go on to verse 4 no, uh, we at verse, go to verse 2 again yep now verse 3 I'm sorry She's ahead of me, which is great. The husband should fulfill his wife's sexual needs, and the wife should fulfill her husband's needs. The wife gives authority over her body to her husband, and the husband gives authority over his body to his wife, even if she doesn't want it. Do... (laughs) Y'all know what I'm talking about. That was an addition. I know the Bible says not to do that, and I, I broke a terrible commandment there. It did not say that. It says this, Do not deprive each other of sexual relations unless you both agree to refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time so you can give yourselves more completely to prayer. This passage tells us three powerful principles about sex. It says sex is a good thing. Number one, God acknowledges that he created us with sexual needs. Do you understand that? God said the husband should fulfill the wife's sexual need and the wife should fulfill the husband's sexual need. God made us to have sexual needs. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. He gave us the desire to have sex for pleasure and to further our race, to have children so that the human race can exist. But secondly, God in this passage said you have sexual needs, but he gave very clear boundaries to our sexuality. Sex is to occur, according to this passage, between a man and woman, a husband and wife, who have committed their lives together in holy matrimony. Go back to the verse 3 there, and it said, Husband should fulfill his wife's sexual needs. You have a man and a woman who have committed their lives together in holy matrimony. Do you understand that? That's some very clear boundaries. If that is offensive to you, I do not mean to be offensive today. If you think, well, the pastor just trying to impose his view on me that's what what I'm trying to do today I believe that this book is God's word and I believe the one that created us knows how we are to function and I believe he gave us a beautiful gift in sex as long as we operate in that gift within his prescribed boundaries A man and a woman come together and join their lives together. Then he says this, that a husband and wife are to be sexually active on a regular basis, frequently. I appreciate that. That is the only amen I've gotten on that in three services today. And I have been waiting for one. Do you know why we pause to say amen on something like that? Do you know why we're afraid to? Some of you wanted to say amen. In fact, some of you men wanted to jump up out of your seat and shout and say, that's the best thing Pastor Andy has ever said in all the years I've been here. But you didn't because there's a degree of shame that we shouldn't be excited about sex if we're Christians. If you're married, you should be excited. Can I get an amen? Amen. If you've committed yourself to holy matrimony, that should be a vital part of your life. See, this this scripture says that going too far before marriage is destructive, but it also says not going far enough after marriage is also destructive. You can say amen to that too. We're celebrating this week the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation when Martin Luther nailed his 95 thesis on the church door and said the just shall live by faith. Do you know somebody asked Martin Luther about sex? 
do you know? They did. Now you know. <laughs> would anybody like to hear what he said? When I read this, I thought, how would you ask Martin Luther about this? Somebody asked Martin Luther how frequently a husband and wife should come together in sexual intimacy. And I love the way he put this. He said, I have found that twice a week seems to be enough to stave off the tempter. <laughs> you can laugh. I think that's funny. Sex is a good and beautiful gift of God to be exercised between husband and wife within the bounds of holy matrimony. Sex only becomes bad when it gets outside of the boundary. Amen? Proverbs 6.27, the writer of Proverbs compares sex to a flame or a fire. And it said this, Can a man scoop a flame into his lap and not have his clothes catch on fire? That's talking about a man who's seeking to have an affair. And it's saying, man, when you go out to have an affair, you're pouring a fire in your lap and you're going to burn your pants. Sex is like a fire. How many of you think a fire is a beautiful thing? How many of you think a fire is a beautiful thing? How many like a campfire? Have you ever gathered around a campfire and just watched the fire? There's something wonderful about that. I was at a friend's house a couple months ago, and he had an old tractor rim from a tractor tire laid out in his yard, and he'd made a fire pit out of that and put rocks around it and made it look all nice. And I thought, man, that's really nice. I told him, this is cool. I need to get one of these. You know what he did? He went out and found me a tractor rim, and I came home a couple weeks later, and there was a tractor rim with rocks and everything right in my yard. He'd even brought me the wood to build a fire with and I thought it's so powerful what's the first thing you do when you build a fire in your yard or out at the campfire you build a ring you build a boundary because a fire inside the ring will bring warmth joy and pleasure but if it gets outside of the ring it can burn down the neighborhood build a fire but put a ring on it you see what I did there didn't you you see what I did there build a fire with a ring the commitment I'll tell you something with sex you got to get the order right marriage then sex now, I know what people say today. Well, you know, I'm going to do my own thing. This is my body, and I can do whatever I want with it. There's a spirit at work in this world today that's about self-autonomy, that I can make my decisions, that I can sleep with whoever I want to be, that I can determine my identity however I want to, and I can say what I am, who I am, and what I want to do, irrespective of what God has ordained and irrespective of his boundaries, I can do what I want. You know what's happened today? We've basically said, I can light a fire anywhere I want to. But friend, you've got to understand, when you light a fire outside of the fire pit, it's going to burn something down in your life. Many times we've set our own lives on fire by taking the flame of sexual activity outside of God's boundaries and we've been burned desperately. Do you know our prison systems today are filled with young men who never had a father? And we could point our fingers at them and say criminals, but let me tell you, behind every one that you call a criminal, there was a little boy at some point that was crying out for a dad that wasn't there, that never had anybody to put his arms around him and love him, that never had anybody to give any violence, that never had anybody to bring correction. And many times, fatherlessness, which is... Fatherlessness is one of the huge crises today in the United States of America that we're not paying attention to. We're dealing with the symptoms. The problem is a lot further back. The problem is this fire has gotten outside of the ring and it's burning society. Young men ever don't, don't have a dad. You know why they don't have a dad? Because dad wanted the pleasure of sex without accepting the responsibility of sex. With the pleasure, there comes a responsibility to being a dad. Do you young men in here, you young teenage boys, you want to have sex, don't deny it. You know how I know that? 
I didn't read it in a book. I used to be a young teenage boy. If you're going to enjoy the pleasure, accept the responsibility. Get the order right. Make the commitment. And then give complete intimacy to somebody. That's safe. That's God's boundaries. That's God's desire. So many times fatherlessness occurs because we don't want to accept the responsibility that comes with sexual activity. We're also bringing all kind of role confusion, all kinds of brokenness into our society. They call it today gender fluidity. And people can decide which gender they're going to be. Now, now let me tell you, if your first reaction to that is disgust, then you need Jesus to work on your heart. I've been around Christians before and some guy comes walking in and, and it's obviously he's wanting to be a girl or vice versa and Christians go, weirdo. Hold back just a little bit. Let Jesus do something in your heart. Because very likely that person had a wound in their lives as a child and a brokenness in their lives as a child that never got healed and they're struggling with the fallout. When I was in middle school, I was targeted by a teacher. And the teacher came to me and said all kind of horrible things into my life and spoke into my life. And I kind of brushed it aside. God saved me from being a victim. I'm already a victim, but He saved me from from a lot I was pastor in this church and I went into a conference board meeting with the, with the Cornerstone Conference I sat down at the table I opened my computer and I looked at the news and I saw that man's face he'd been put in prison for molesting young men at the same time I was there I knew the, I knew the people I knew the witnesses and I said thank you Jesus for saving me let me just tell you something even with dealing with that I've had to talk to God a lot and God's had to work on me through prayer and through people talking to me and counseling me to get some of what that man put in my head out are you with me can I get an amen if you struggle with brokenness because somebody has wounded you I want to tell you you're in a place right here that is safe you're in a place right here where we will open our arms to you and love you no matter what your struggle is. You struggle with gender, fluidity, if you think that's, maybe you don't think it's a struggle, maybe you've accepted it. If you're dealing with homosexuality and something like that, or just sexual addiction, pornography, you're in a safe place right here. We're not going to throw you out. We're not going to see you as broken and damaged. We're going to see you as somebody that Jesus loves. Can I get an amen? Church, are we committed to that? Are we just playing games here? Or are we going to love the people in this world in which God has put us? Are we really going to love them? One of our biggest challenges today is this, that people and the culture tells us to embrace our brokenness rather than be healed and instead of helping people be healed from brokenness we tell them that's just a part of who you are that's your identity and brokenness God embraces us in our brokenness but he doesn't embrace our brokenness as well he embraces us to heal us and you've needed healing and I've needed healing and Jesus is the place to find that. I'm asking you today by the authority of God's word to commit your life to healthy sexuality within the boundaries that God has set. I'm asking you today that if you're not married to wait until you're married to be sexually active to keep from burning your life up. I'm asking you today that if you're married and you have a problem sexually with your spouse and you're not fulfilled, to find help in Jesus Christ and we will be there to help you. Well, preacher, it's my body. I can do what I want with it. You sure can. 
but give heed to those who've gone before you and don't make the same mistakes they've made don't give yourself away to somebody until they're willing to commit their whole life to you can I get an amen a guy asked Jesus one time he said uh, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not and Jesus said show me a coin so the guy pulls out a coin and Jesus said whose image is on that coin and the guy looked on it and said Caesar's Jesus said well give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to God what belongs to God and the guy walked away I think the guy walked away one question too soon I think there was one follow up question that Jesus was trying to get him to we established what belongs to Caesar because it had his image on it the guy should have said okay I know now what belongs to Caesar what belongs to God Jesus and Jesus would have said whose image is on you we are all made in the image of God whether you're a believer or not a believer you may have come here today to just figure out what this mess is all about and figure out your life I don't know where you are I don't know what denomination you're from everybody that breathes is created in the image of God his mark is upon us and the highest calling upon our lives is to glorify him with these bodies he's given us I'm calling you today to sexual health to sexual healing and to sexual wholeness by getting inside the ring when you get inside that ring let it burn burn baby burn some of you really want to say amen now but you won't you're going to let me be embarrassed today but outside the ring it'll burn your house down now quickly here's what I want to tell you I'm going to close with this what does the church do with the culture we live in we have to learn to build a bridge to people that disagree with us are you with me today we have to learn to build a bridge to people that disagree with us that doesn't mean we compromise what we believe that doesn't mean we throw away the Bible that doesn't mean we won't talk about sin but we have to relationally build a bridge so that people can walk over it and get to Jesus I may make some of you mad today but I'm going to tell you what I think I think a lot of times we're our own worst enemy you'll never change a person's heart by calling them a pervert you hear me you may think you're standing up for truth by saying something like that and you know what I find a lot of people think they're standing up for truth but all their stand is doing is making them feel better about themselves it's not helping anybody get to Jesus you can go on Facebook if you want or go wherever you want and say well these perverts I've heard Christians people who claim to be Christians say we should pack up all the homosexuals and ship them off to a country where they can all live together that is not the heart of Jesus Christ or the kingdom of God we're called to reach this world we live in with the good news of our Savior he said himself I didn't come into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved here's what we got to do church you ready I'm going to give you three things it's always three number one give them Jesus before you launch into a conversation about their issues Jesus first anytime you come to a person saying listen you got a problem anybody ever come to you and told you you had a problem before they were willing to love you you ever had anybody in your life, even as a Christian, come try to straighten you out before you were convinced they cared about you? If you come telling me you want to straighten me out and I don't know that you love me, I don't want to hear from you. Surprise, surprise, the rest of the world's that way too. They don't need the church to stand up and just point out all their problems. They need the church to introduce them to our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we've got to lead with Jesus because if he gets into their lives, if they meet him, they will be changed by his love. Lead with Jesus. Secondly, you've got to decide whether you want to be a social commentator or a disciple maker. There's so many social commentators out there. Are you with me? I mean, I have my views, and I don't mind sharing them if you ask me. 
But I'm not going to spout off every day about how evil the world is and about how terrible sinners are. Sinners sin because they're sinners, and that's what sinners do. If sin gets worse, then the church, we're not doing our job to get Jesus to the world. So instead of being a social commentator and thinking it's your job to straighten everybody out and weigh in on every controversy of the day, you need to stop and ask yourself, is that what I want to be, or do I really want to make be a disciple maker? I want to get people to Jesus. Last, and this is so important, never forget how much you've been forgiven. Never forget that God has forgiven us of so much that we don't have the right to point fingers. If we're pointing fingers, it better be pointing people to Him. Are you with me? Are you with me? <laughs> Say, Pastor boy, you're going soft on sin today. That's okay if you think that. Nothing is so hard on sin as grace. Nothing destroys sin like grace. And that's what we're called to do. Would you pray with me today? Bow your heads, please, with me all across this sanctuary. Lord, thank you for this day and the privilege we have.